Hi, my name's Andrew and welcome to the making of Maybe Never. I'm here today to introduce you to the band, to talk to them about their experiences, their musical influences and what their upcoming plans are. We're going to go in depth on their creative process, what makes them tick as a band and what you as a viewer can expect here on this new YouTube channel. So sit back, relax and enjoy the start of this new journey, the making of Maybe Never. I have a question. So I have a question. A question. So I have a question. 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 So I have a question. Get the three old farts, make a record, and get it into the charts without the support of a record label. More to the point, would anybody be interested in following that journey to see if we could? Would you? Not that we've got anything against record labels, but take a look at us. Who the hell would sign us? Seven kinds of pain Oh There's seven kinds of pain I'm not the one to blame Actually, I'm, I'm going to have my specs on because everything's a bit blurry so I suppose... Yeah, but I don't need you to have your specs on to focus this, can no. you? Don't you need to check that they don't um, glare or reflect or something? And if they do, what we're going to do about it? I'll, I'll, take, I'll take them off and just um, <laughs> look around me when I can, to see who can, who's actually speaking to me. It's just more comfortable with an old man. Can you not detect who's speaking to you by the tone of the voice and the well, timbre? Who said that? Is that you? Anyway, get, get yourself. Come on! Talking off. Everything's nice and clear at this distance. It's just reading menus that fucks me. I always forget to take that glass of the bloody restaurant. Yeah. I'm not, still no good at that. No, that's exactly what happens to me. The rest of the family have to read it out. To yes, me. that's right. <laughs> you know, yeah. God's waiting room isn't far away. That's it. <laughs> I'm not sure I've been wrong. Seven kinds of pain Calling a, a budget a physical Try event is a bit like calling diarrhea an intestinal event, isn't it? <laughs> we all know what you mean. Just take some short breaks between what you're going to say next. Give me some editing points. Not that I want to edit you out, little flower, but... <laughs> what I was thinking, if I don't need pauses, you can't edit me out. <laughs> <laughs> My editing skills are getting better. <laughs> and they're all faint. <laughs> Chaps, thanks for joining us here for uh, for this chat about the, the band and uh, how we've come to this point. Let's go back right to the start. How did the band first form? When did it form? How did you come together? Ooh. Well, you you started. It was your band. I was going to say yeah, Paul yeah. there, yeah, in your in your flat living well, room. Well, I think just to rewind a little bit further oh, than yeah. that. So, you actually came to lodge at my flat. Yeah. Um, I think when I was at law college. That's right. Sort of, I don't know, eighty one, eighty two. Yeah. And then when I got back, I remember we we wrote a song. Um, you had. I thought you borrowed a double bass from one of your friends. It was I borrowed it from Barnsley Council well, music yeah. department because I was a teacher there. Yeah. That was probably the only instrument Barnsley Council actually had. <laughs> they didn't have it for long. It spent a whole year on on my bed. Right. Yeah. And we wrote a very early song. That's the only thing you could gone. get in your bed, wasn't it? Oh, right. Yeah. We did. And I think that was. 
that must have been sort of the embryo of the band. Um, so that's you and me, that's two of us. But then, then we didn't use that song first, did we? When, when we got together in your living room, we started with one of your songs um, called Adolescence. Oh, okay. So we worked on Yesterday's Gone as a band later. But yes, that's the first yeah. collaboration we did. Also, hang on, when we, we did some music together in the student union at the university. We did where I'd written a piano piece which had a strange time signature. I think it had a bit of 5-4 and 6-4 in and you helped me work that out. Mm. And then we took your drum kit um, into the piano room and we recorded it. So that's actually probably the first recording we did together yeah, so that we knew um, each of us wanted and could do music and that's when I came to lodge in your flat yeah. um, and there was the double bass. It went on from there. But the first thing, the first song I remember working on was Adolescence. <laughs> <off. laughs> <laughs> this is why we need the ability to edit. Once he's going, you can't stop well, him. Hang so anyway, that's <laughs> it was, it's turned out, as Paul said, to be quite a complicated question because what? when did it start? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, that's when yeah, it started. It's, that's hard, isn't it? So then we, we were recruiting other band members. So mm -hmm. we got Russell as, as a bass player. And I think you, Rob, were the third guitarist because we had Ian Garth and then Dan Fairest and then yourself. Yeah. So yeah. Russell was, yeah, Russell was in a band that I was in before I went to college. So he played bass in that. Yeah. So that's how we managed to call him. And then your introduction to the band was via Monica, my wife, because you were. Um, I think a, a client of hers at the yeah, had hairdressing done. salon. Well, it's that hairdresser's conversation, isn't it? When they're doing your hair, they'll say, oh, you've been on anywhere nice on holiday. And, uh, you know, those types of questions that I, you know, can't really. You had some good sex with your boys <laughs> yes. recently. And um, so I just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's not the sort of inquiry that I would make to my hairdresser, actually. Um, so I just, as part of that, you know, questioning thing, it came up that I played the guitar and she just happened to mention that her boyfriend was looking for a guitarist. So I rocked up down at this flat. Nice play on words. Nice there. play on words, yeah. yes. And uh, I walked into this, uh, into the living room and uh, Keith was there in his tracky bottoms with this pink um, synth it's a Roland SH-101 that you used to play like a guitar. They call them Sintars synth now, I think. Um, Paul had got a chair with um, a rubber pad and a, a jumper over his hi-hat or whatever to try and deaden the sound because it was a flat. And then there was Russ there on his bass looking like John Lennon in his bandy legs. <laughs> and uh, I walked in and I thought, bearing in mind, these guys are a bit older than me. And so I was 17, 18, yeah, 17, 18. Yeah. I walked into this room and went, oh, fuck my <laughs> idiot. And um, Paul had got uh, a dome lamp and he'd got like this rubber octopus, pink octopus thing that was draped over this lamp. And I'm looking at this lamp thinking, what the hell? <laughs> we were so much older than you, we had mortgages. You did, yes. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, so that was our introduction. And I think um, the first track that I contributed on was infatuation yes. I think. Da, 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 da. Um, that guitar lick which you came up with. Yeah. And that's when we thought he's in. Yeah. He'll do. He'll do. Thirty eight years later we're regretting that decision. <laughs> <laughs> Thinking back to those um those yesterdays we've we've all got a first record, the first record that we bought from a from a music store. What what was said record for each of you guys? Um, Vagabonds of the Western World by Thin Lizzy, which had a single called The Rocket on it. Mm. So that was my very first album, the first album I ever bought. First one I bought with my own money was Elton John's Greatest Hits. Yeah. But my mum was a big influence and she bought me Beatles singles, uh, the first of which I still have when I was three. Mm. I think that was She Loves You, so I've, I've still got the vinyl. <laughs> Yeah, similar to Keith, I, I got given a lot of records, um, but I suppose the first big influence in my life was the police. Regatta to Blank was probably the first 
album that I bought and kept playing mm. and thinking, ah. um, and really I've I've stuck with Sting as a songwriter ever since. I think his writing is just phenomenal. It's a different world. You mentioned a couple of those early influences from from those first records. Are there other artists from around that time who you still feel today influence the music that you make? From a production point of view, I think in the 80s there were the likes of uh, Tears for Fears, Peter Gabriel, Sting was another one, a bit of Genesis, it, all the, and I'm talking purely from a production point of view, those were, those really were the type of uh, artists that made me realise that there was more to music than a guitar line or a vocal line mm. and that you started to listen deeper into the song and pick out instrumentations or riffs or, that were kind of sat behind the arrangement but without it the arrangement wouldn't be as you know as good as what they are. Mm. Well I think it's difficult to pinpoint influences because it's a, a huge melting pot isn't it? Yeah. With a great many styles of music um, captured by the three of us. Yeah, and I think that's the other thing is that it's it's a meld, as always in collaboration, it's a meld of musical influences. Um, when Russ was uh, around, he he played the bass in in a more of a classical guitar style. Well, that's style, what he learned on. Because yeah. that's what he learned on, and it just brought a different different tone to, to the music at that time and I, although we we all like very similar music I think our starting points were slightly different mm. weren't they? Yeah, I mean, mine, mine was definitely standard pop music with the Beatles and the Stones and so on in the 60s and that's why I say I thought you're, you're you I had singles you had albums yes well I started off as quite a heavy rock fan so Thin Lizzy, Deep Purple, Led Zeppelin yeah, my early ones at Saxon, Rainbow, those sort of bands yes. as well, you know. As the years have, have, have gone on, what kind of uh, music have you been listening to more more recently that you're enjoying? Are there, are there influences in there as well? I've still got Alice Cooper in the car at the moment. <laughs> <laughs> so um, school's out, I'm listening to. So I do like a, a, a big variety in melody lines and a, a, an artist that your dad likes and he t we turned up we said i've been listening to this guy he's really good music oh what what do they call him oh i don't know something like dustbin lid lad <laughs> dustbin lid lad never heard. so who, when we we're trying to work out who this dustbin lid lad was uh so he played as one of the tracks turned out to be rag and bone man so <laughs> he is now affectionately known as dustbin <laughs> lid lad um yeah. so but you listen to that um that artist and the melody lines that he writes it, there's good movement in the melody lines mm -hmm. um and I, I that's i like that but again for me it's it's more about production it's you know going back a bit you know trevor horn and seal there was kate bush you know mm -hmm. again from a production point of view they were just phenomenal artists because i write a lot of lyrics i always like I would like a song to tell a story or, or, or spike emotions and be meaningful. Um, and it's Peter Gabriel as well, mm. when he went solo mm -hmm. from Genesis. I think the joy is actually discovering music from the past that you didn't know about. Yeah. Um, one of the f my favourite albums, which is an ancient one, is Kind of Blue by Miles Davis, yeah. which I discovered a couple of years ago. And the other night there was a programme um, regarding the songs of the James Bond franchise, yes, yeah, and that was that was a very interesting program, and the music is just of such a high quality. Adele, I, I think, is uh, another artist. Some of her tracks, I think, are, are very well written, very yeah. well produced. Now, talking of the James Bond thing, I think Billie Eilish is uh, has already realised potential, but uh, but again, like I like what she did on that. Yeah, you know, she again came up with something a bit more creative mm. so yeah. there are artists out there but yeah. it, it, it's not as easy to roll off the tongue I think as yeah. you can do a vocal line quietly and really yeah. effectively is, is Billie Eilish's real strength I think Talking as, as the production being a big influence on what you're doing but also thinking live production as well there's nothing more thrilling than going and seeing a, a band playing at the top of its game 
last few years have been quite tricky obviously being able to congregate and watch watch some live music what was the what was the last gig that you went to well yours Joe Jackson no yours was last week wasn't it oh Steve Hackett for yeah. me yeah oh, really? still around is he yes he's okay. doing Genesis Revisited so he right. he performed Foxtrot with his band it was very good mine was Joe Jackson so you and I yeah. went to see Joe Jackson and you all yeah. oh, prior to that I saw George Benson um, I've seen Elvis Costello this year and Nick Mason's Saucer Full of Secrets doing early Pink Floyd so I've seen a few things this year. I'm, I'm not so keen on going to see live music now the reason being is that the auditorium's full of fuckwits <laughs> <laughs> if it was just me and the band I'd love that but yeah, yeah. we went to see um, Van Morrison earlier this year and sat in front of us were two um, relatively young women I'd say in the 20s and they just shouted talked to each other all the way through hmm. and in the end I just had to you know, shout at them to shut the fuck up because it just spoiled the, the mind you, old Van the man he's a grumpy old soddy <laughs> he, never, he came on, he never said hello, he never said thank you for coming, sang all his songs walked off while the band were doing a about a 10 minute play out and that was it Yeah. no, no audience participation whatsoever, no yeah communication to the audience just sang his song you've probably the great seen songs. the two in front of you yeah probably thought, uh, yeah. Um, so now I, I, I it would take there's only a few artists I think that I would and also the price oh, I mean yeah. some of the prices that they're now asking mm. to come and my, my eldest only wanted to take his um, his girlfriend Luisa to see Coldplay uh, they live out in Spain yeah and he got the ticket prices 350 euros each yep so he took her to a neighboring town Cuenca for the weekend instead yeah. <laughs> yeah. And I went to see um, the Icelandic uh, Eurovision guy uh, is it Daddy Freya mm. um, because we're trying to support the lead mill at the moment so when they put things on we go and see what it's like yeah I'd, I'd never I don't watch Eurovision normally <laughs> I'd never seen him before but it was a lot of fun yeah and uh, he's, he's got a good voice and he's a striking uh, figure on stage because he is actually seven feet tall so it's nowhere mm. near as sophisticated as you two I went to watch some Eurovision thing it was fun as long as you don't you know bring that Eurovision influence into our music I don't no, mind no, no. <laughs> the previous one uh, that I'd seen is probably uh, more in line with my taste we went to see Billy Bragg he was, All at, right, yeah. he was at the lead mill and that is uh, He's a very accomplished performer as well live and it's just him uh, and a few guitars um, that's impressive when you can hold an audience with just you on one instrument mm. for, well, a, for a whole evening and he did it well I think putting the fuckwits in the audience to one side for a minute the nice thing about the gigs this year uh, has been the surprise at how good some of the mm. artists and the bands are mm. Joe Jackson was sublime it's mm. absolutely <coughs> superb you talk about the lead mill obviously a, a very historic musical venue around here needing that support are there are there any particular venues that you would have played or would like to play as a as a band what well, would like to play city yeah. hall i yeah. mean if, if ever we got the chance to do a night at city hall in fact the lead singer uh, well one of the singers we use vernon um he's touring with a production called lost in music and um he had a band prior to that and his keyboard player Tony um, are both involved in this Lost in Music and last mm. year they played the City Hall and he said it was unreal you know all the the years that he'd been mm. to the City Hall and seen all his idols and last year and he's, he'll be doing it again in November this year um, to, to be on that stage mm. he said it was just unreal the uh, sound in there is awful do you think oh because well i remember i have i one very particular moment which just made me the the hairs rise on on the back of my neck and we went together to see tears for fears yes. mm. and i don't know who the female singer was who started alita adams, set. Alita adams. Mm, yeah, sure. she sat down at the piano and started to sing and i can feel the shiver now mm. it was absolutely wonderful but that's was because they transfixed. had that's because they had probably one of the best 
sound engineers because right. that place is a nightmare. So, yeah. With it being an oval, yeah, the yeah. sound just bounces off. You, you can off. get it right though. Steve Hackett's uh, production team got it yeah. right when I saw them. So I think it's making sure it's not too loud so yeah. that you don't get that. And you've got fills as you go around. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I think, I think not that it would ever happen unless, you know, uh, we had a stroke of luck but just to do one gig if I had to do one gig in my life to do it at the City Hall yeah. would, would, would be it I suppose Bringing things to the present day you've been as a band for, for many many years you're releasing this first record why now? why, why 2022, 2023 to release the first record? It's taken that long to get it together <laughs> hasn't it really? <laughs> for various reasons goodness me life life gets in the way yeah um we've all had to work for a living as most people do um in the early days we were rehearsing as a gigging band mm. not that we did many gigs but we weren't even that was the aim yeah it? we we not even contemplated doing any recordings um then we decided that we'd try and do some of our tracks and we booked a week in a recording studio um, what year 1987. Was that? 87. 87. Yeah. And that generated three tracks that are on a cassette somewhere. So I suppose we have, although we didn't publish it as such, we just had a whole load of tapes printed off, most of which are somewhere around here. Um, I have a few. And then um, I started getting a little bit more into the recording side. Um, bought this keyboard here, which has got a sequencer in. Uh, then we bought a Mac and and this was at our whole old house and we turned one of our bedrooms uh, into a, a rehearsal space and say recording space we didn't really know what we were doing I had no recording knowledge ability you know it was mm. definitely learning off the hoof so that's where all this started and that's mm. when when we decided to move one of the prerequisites of the house that we were potentially going to buy was it had to house a recording studio yeah I think in answering your question it's a it's a quality control issue yeah so we've been listening to what we've recorded over the years thinking oh that's wonderful come back to it a year later and think oh it's not actually and I think at this stage we're we're in a position where we can do the music justice yeah and record it properly I think yeah. that's why now yeah. rather than previously yeah this EP was was written and in theory finished Oh, four or five years ago and that at that time I was getting more into researching and studying recording techniques post-production techniques mixing techniques and the more I delved into that the more I realized that what we got wasn't anywhere close to the sort of quality that we were after and much to the annoyance of um, certainly my wife um, she was saying but the people that are gonna won't know but, you know it's just a song to them and I was like yeah but I know and you know the my sort of um, idols in the production world if they listen to it they would be you know pulling a face and so we had to make sure that it was of a level of quality that I, I was happy that my contemporaries would listen to it and go ah, that's that's all right it's not going to be up to you know full professional standard but and hence this room this room had to change substantially mm. because the acoustics of the old studio was so poor that it was adversely affecting the mix yeah and again I did a lot of research into acoustics and absorption and yeah it took probably a good six months to come up with the design for this studio um, and as soon as we started to put in the acoustic treatment you could tell that the difference in sound was, was incredible. I invested in you know better speakers, some more gear so yeah I think we, we've taken those steps to get us to where we are today. Mm. The room actually made probably had the biggest influence on the sound it was that bad mm. um, but I think we've resolved that now and uh, yeah it's not a bad sounding room to to mix in. Talk me through your creative process as a as a band when you start with a with a song. Does it start from a an instrumental concept or a or a lyrical idea? I think there are many 
ways that yeah. it starts. Yeah. So I think there's one common thing is that one of us brings something. I'm not sure. And then the others work with it. I'm not sure that's always right because I know Rob yeah. and I have we've just jammed. We've just played stuff and hoped that something would would drop out of of the session. So we can give you one example. Um, the the, si the single off the EP, um, Hard Times, that is long in the making. That started when I was first going out with uh, Fiona, my wife, and her mum had a piano in her living room. So while Fiona and her mum were prepping tea, I'd be, and I'm not a pianist, and I was just playing around, and came up with this chordal structure. Um, and played it and worked on it a bit and uh, never thought no more about it and then we bought our first house and it was just around the corner from where Keith lived and uh, when I say to you, it was literally walking distance <clears throat> and many a night it would get to seven eight eight o'clock at night and you know so we're bored so we walked around to his house knock on the door we're bored <laughs> ah come on let's get so we you know cook some tea get the wine out and you know just have a chill night and I started playing this uh, choral structure on the keys piano and we'd had, a, we'd had a class or two I think by then and you said oh, I've got some lyrics and you just started to apply some lyrics that you'd already got written to it. November 84 there was a date on the bottom of them but this must have been this would have later been after if that, when yeah. you were in Nether Edge so well, you, played, yeah. you played it and then I sang to it and that was it. It so must have been 87, 88. Did you come up with the melody? Oh, well, we probably came up together as we as you yeah, were playing the lyrics. Yeah, to go with the chords. Yeah. Yeah. But it was putting together two things that had been written disparately. I'd got these yeah. lyrics, and they weren't a song. They were, I don't know, it could have, it might have been a poem or something like that. But then I suddenly thought, oh, the rhythm of those, I'll go upstairs and find them. The rhythm of those words fits yeah. what he's done here, and somehow, yeah that's how it was born and then of course we bring it to you and then we all work on it then and, and yeah we all contribute as to how that song developed but then as Paul said there would be some songs where we'd get the mini disc uh, on record Paul would go through to the drum room and we'll just jam for two three hours um, and out of that we might you know well, start to making up your mind and time will tell, tell. probably started off in yeah. that way so I would have come up with some drum idea that I quite wanted. And then in other instances, I might have come up with a, a, a melody or a, a, an arrangement. And then we'll say to Keith, it, take that away, come up with something. And he'll come up with a varied melody and lyrics to that. And we'll work on that together. And then other times Keith will say, I've got this song and he'll bring his song. And so as Paul said, there are many different ways. But I think the beauty is with us, we're not we're not overly precious about the original idea. Many of our mm. songs have taken uh, um, production changes and arrangement changes that move it well away from where the original song mm -hmm. started. Um, Are we just talking about the EP? But for me, the, the most interesting one is uh, second best yeah. in those terms. So Paul and Rob get together, they had they had a jam, so there's guitar and drums, and it's a kind of funky Nile Rodgers yeah. kind of uh, instrumental background. And they asked me to put some lyrics on it, and we did that. Uh, and then the next time I came back here, Rob has put a completely different back in to this song, just with a piano and a cello, mm. and it does work better. Um, so sometimes something goes into uh, into the recording. Sometimes we record it and then it just turns out, you said, no, those th those words don't match the style of song. Oh, yeah. So he did a different style to go with it. So sometimes one of us goes away and works on something on their own and the others say, yeah, that's a great idea. That's a great idea or no, <laughs> yeah. we can't do that. And it's helpful at being three because there's always a majority decision yeah. on how these things happen. It used to be a little more uh, troubled with Russell, didn't it? When we could have a two all draw. Yeah. And it'd have to be a fight in the pub. Yeah. 
So as, as Keith um, alluded to, the, the EP is pretty much recorded and yeah. it just needs a bit of final mixing and is ready to be released. Um, but we are currently working on an album. Um, the material is the written in terms of the songs and the structures pretty much but the arrangements and the production all need to um, be put in place and what we're hoping for is as part of this project the making of maybe never is we're hoping to attract other musicians artists to collaborate with us yeah. so for example one of the tracks that we were looking at the other week I kind of came up with the idea of it'd be great if we could have a gospel choir to you know do a lot of the the, the vocals on this um, now it just so happens that you know within the, our collection of friends and acquaintances we know a gospel choir so yeah. it's going to be exploring whether we can get them to come down and and do a recording less problematic than the bagpipes idea well that's <laughs> another idea yes we we um, you were talking about one of the last gigs i went to i went down to Orly reservoir and there was a bagpipe band playing and i thought you know what we could actually record some of those yeah so we've got a track that's got some pipe sort of sounds that we've sampled we don't quite work um so yeah we'd like to try and arrange for eight bagpipe players to come and play you know backing track for one of our songs so that, that's going to be interesting just you know what that's going to sound like in our big room downstairs it's very technical for the song as well because when we tried to match it to the actual notes when we worked out what bagpipes can actually play we had to detune the song by four or five semitones or something like yeah. that so well we hope knows how we're going to sing it yeah. we're hoping that one of the future episodes will will go through that process yeah. of what we're having to do to that track to get it yeah because bagpipes have got a very limited scope so we've got to adjust the music to match the bagpipe you can't change the bagpipe to match the music so we'll probably do an episode on that to talk further about the lyrics Keith for you is, is that a process that's very much a solo process that you keep to yourself or others that get involved Ooh, well that that again depends if they've got a piece of instrumental music mm. and say can you put something onto this then it, it's a little bit of a commission so I'm already working with something that's done um, I suppose during my life I've often come up with words first and then music has been matched to it uh, afterwards uh, one of our songs time will tell um, that line uh, is me dad because that that was one of his and uh, I don't know I just throw that in and then you took that and built the song up mm. so the, my only contribution to that song was only time will tell and then Keith and Paul took it on from there so. yeah is there ever stages where ideas are on the table and they have to be put to one side or or, or disposed of in a way before what one, one of the disadvantages of having computerized recording is you save everything yeah and if i was to show you the list of tracks that we've got that we've kind of put on the back burner hundreds of them <laughs> and 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 that is a, a in itself is an art in deciding what what you keep working on and what you just put to one side because not everything will work uh, we found uh, the other day for hard times um, because everything that you record is saved mm. and I was looking down the the list of tracks that have been um, deactivated because we didn't and I found uh, a track where Nigel who was a sax player on that track had also brought his flute and there was a flute part I was thinking, what was the bloody flute part I can't remember a flute part so we reactivated that track and he recorded a flute part over the introduction. Mm. Now, as a part, the the part he played was beautiful. But it didn't match the song. No. And it was there for a while, and we, and it's 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 the art of not necessarily what you put into a production. Sometimes it's that stripping out and saying it doesn't actually need that. Yeah. Um, and that does take time, and you've got to sometimes come back with fresh ears because. You kind of think oh that's how it's going to be and then one of us might just have the idea and say just let's just drop the drums out 
we often try and do that but he won't have it but <laughs> <laughs> and we do and you know that then is how the arrangements and the productions evolve over time yeah you mentioned um before about different types of musicians coming in and playing on on the records of, of future records who else have you you had in previously and, and worked with in this space i suppose the one we need to talk about most is Vern because he he had the biggest impact mm -hmm. on our music um, and again we'll go back to hard times um, Keith had done the vocals for that because Keith was our lead singer and always done the vocals uh, and we thought for that song we, we wanted somebody that had got a bit more soul it, it needed something a bit more yeah. and we'd come across Vern again through <laughs> through Paul's wife who knew Vern's mother-in-law I think and we'd been to see a gig or I, I, yeah, I'm not sure how we did went to see him perform with his band yeah and had a chat with him and asked if he'd be interested it, yeah. in coming along and he said yes thankfully so so he came along and the first thing he did was you know the vocals for hard times and we were just like holy shit <laughs> it just yeah made a huge difference so out of the five on the ep Vern's done four of those um at the moment he's done one on the new album we'll probably uh, hopefully get him to do some more so he he's he he definitely made a big impact on the music and one of the hopes is that we can maybe start working on a separate album to our album yeah which is going to be more Vern's album yeah he's going to direct and uh, give us guidance as to what style of music he wants and hopefully we can do a bit of, of work on that um, but that he's he's one of the contributors that we're, we're really pleased that we we ended up working with I like the voice of the guy. Is it Gary? Gary. Gary Turner. Who did uh, Seven Kinds of Pain. Yeah, so he's the singer with Muskoka Drive. I play with uh, Muskoka's keyboard player from time to time. So um, that's how we got that particular connection. And also John, who was the bass player in Muskoka Drive, yeah. played an electric upright bass on that track. So that, again, that I can play the bass. I've got a bass, but I'm not a bass player. Mm. So, although you can maybe come up with a, a rough guide, a route of where you'd like the bass to be, the flourishes and the style, uh, you need a bass player, you need somebody that, that is accomplished on their instrument. Um, excuse the pun. Nigel, of course, Nigel Manning. the Old Nigel, yeah. yeah. Sax player, he definitely deserves a mention. He's one of those musicians that is sickening, in that you play him the track and go, oh yeah yeah um, let me just go in let me just go in he doesn't i don't give him any notes don't give him any chordal structure give him nothing mm. he'll just listen to it go in and he just runs off these mm. no no I'll, I'll do that again and i don't know a half a dozen takes 10 takes and the it's just perfect it's like unbelievable how they can go for it takes me forever i i need to keep going and i hit I have to hit all the wrong notes to find the right notes mm. but again he's he's yeah. he's a trained and accomplished musician so he automatically knows what key you're in what notes are those and brilliant uh, it just lifts again lifts the music hugely we'll, we'll come more on to how the studio came to be is, is there anyone in particular that you would absolutely love to be able to host here and work with in the studio well, we've got one track that I've always said Michael Bublé is the uh, the artist of choice. Yeah, we're yeah. waiting for the call back. But I'm not sure <laughs> yeah. that, that that'll happen. Another one where you need Gloria Estefan. We're yeah. waiting for the call back. Yeah. Um, if Trevor Horn's free and he wants to come and help us with production, that that would be great. Um, I quite like Peter to Peter Gabriel. That is to Bob along and, yeah. and Sting, of course. If if actually, what would be better for Sting is if he's in his Tuscan studio just, and he just gives, gives us a call, call. and <laughs> say, "Come, come over, lads. You know, we'll we'll do a bit together." And we miss that a little bit. We do miss that influence of other accomplished musicians helping us to lift our music. Um, one of the tracks that we've got, I I like to um, listen to a lot of jazz. I'd like to play more jazz on the piano um 
but it's challenging and I, I'm not a pianist so it's hard to to get that sound to get that feel to get those um, progressions and one of the tracks we've got I would love for a proper jazz pianist to come it would lift the music Jamie Cullen we're waiting for the callback yeah yeah, yeah. You talked about live music um, you started out or talked about starting out as looking to be a gigs band how, how much did you do that in the past and do you miss it these days not a lot and no <laughs> <laughs> Um, we did a bit in the mid 80s I've done some live work since with other bands um, but it's I can take it or leave it there really yeah, yeah. I, it's a lot of work and mm. certainly small bands you spend half your life just lugging gear and by the time you've set up you're knackered <laughs> and then you've got to do a gig and then you've got to lug it all back again and all that for the price of a bit in fact two of the three of the gigs we did we paid for <laughs> we didn't charge uh, the audience at all we just mm. paid for the hire of a room and, and did the gig and they were enjoyable I suppose but just a huge amount of work and I much prefer coming in and just hitting the master switch and everything's on yeah <laughs> that's so much easier uh, as, as a drummer the idea of having your drums permanently set up where you don't have to lug them around set yeah. them up take them down is just so appealing <laughs> talk further about the studio and i know that the studio is going to be a huge part of of the channel here where where were the embryonic stages of that um and that process to get to where we are today this keyboard this uh this keyboard that's got a sequencer in that was my mm -hmm. first sort of foray into recording um yeah so we used that we used my first electronic drum kit as well and we had and we had a little um four track we still got it somewhere a little four track Task recorder Tascam yeah. recording onto cassettes mm. and that that was it I, I was hooked on recording and producing music that's that's where my that's probably why I've not kept up with the, the playing side because I'm more interested in the production side mm. and the mixing and the sound and it does frustrate me sometimes that my playing ability has disappeared that, that is frustrating I, I feel the same uh, about my playing ability but I think that's the difference isn't it if you're a gigging band and then you can go professional then you play all the time and you get good um, the great thing uh, I think probably we all turn to recording because we couldn't do it full time mm. and so if you you record something and then you've got a week before you hear it again because you're at work looking after the children and that kind of thing um, the recording is a great way of, of, of keeping your performance and then working on it again um, but you simply there simply isn't enough opportunity to to practice when when you don't do it full time so recordings a great uh, a great way of keeping what you do and 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 uh, when you do a good performance you've got it rather than a, a lot of the stuff that's recorded there are guitar solos that I've only ever played to get the recording mm. never played them since wouldn't know how to play them um, so they are I mean they're never one take it's about 54 takes for me to get a guitar solo down because again I'm not an accomplished player um, and it's frustrating in that I think I can create the notes I can create the licks the riffs the melodies and all the rest of it I'm not a proud man if somebody could come in and play it better than me I'm quite happy for them you know I don't need to be the guitarist on our tracks mm. I, I don't mind writing the parts and then if somebody can come and play it better than I can good luck you know come on in um, the nice thing about Pro Tools is it's really the democratization of music isn't it in the sense that you don't have to be an accomplished player to contribute to a wonderful piece of music yeah because you can edit <laughs> yeah you can and, and that does work uh, on a lot of occasions but what editing doesn't do is it doesn't give you the feel yeah and if you you know if you've got an accomplished musician that just I don't know might just play ahead of the beat a bit you can't edit that in you can't program that because it's a feel thing uh, and you can kind of tell sometimes when a piece of music's been edited to death mm. um, so you have to be careful I think but it does 
does allow a, a mediocre player to sound a lot better than what they actually are and I am testament to that in terms of um, when, when you're in the studio and you're putting those those finishing touches what are you able to, to do here when do, when do you know yeah that song is now finished and it doesn't need any further work can it have too much work almost um okay the sequence we can do this is as professional a standard now from a mixing point of view as you get anywhere um and the reason i can say that is a lot of people mix in the box by that i mean they don't need to have a big mixing desk our mixing desk is now a piece of art yeah um because it's all done in Pro Tools um, or whichever door that people use. So all the um, outboard gear that you see here, we have got versions and more and more in Pro Tools. So we can mix to the same standard as you know professional mixing. The talent part of that might be missing, but the technology is there for us to do it. Mm. Um, we Once we've got the songs mixed, uh, and we are happy with those, which is a challenge, um, <laughs> getting us happy with, with our mix. Um, but we would then take it to a mastering house. I think that last step, it's vital that you use a, a trained mastering engineer. Um, and again, we're hoping to document that process. There's, I haven't approached them yet, but there is uh, a mastering facility in Sheffield that uh, I think we may be able to use. So if if they're willing to be part of this channel and, and mm. allow us to film the process, if not the whole process of them doing the mastering, but at least the, the fundamentals, uh, then hopefully that'd be something that we can put on the channel uh, in due course. Looking at your question, the process of coming up with the, the final version of the song is quite a long and arduous one. Yeah. Because generally we've probably recorded much more than actually ends up on the final mix. So we go through the process of deciding what to keep and what to lose. Yeah. Um, and at some point, I guess we think, oh yeah, I think we're there now. I think this sounds about right. Well, it does sometimes happen that a few weeks later we listen to it again and say, ah, no, not quite right. <laughs> so it's a, it's an ongoing process. Yeah. Well, this, this is my thing. I so, say, you know, there comes a point guys where you've actually got to finish. So okay. here's a challenging question. Have you actually, is there actually one song you would say it's there and just ready to go? Two. Two? Two. Two are done. Okay. Time will tell and uh, seven kinds of pain. Okay. They're mixed and ready to be mastered. I won't okay. change them. Well, I think the other three are performed, aren't they? Oh, yeah, they're, they're, yeah. Oh, yeah. They are rough mixed and it won't take very long to get those. Yeah. And I, I know we mentioned it earlier, but the, the, the changing of the acoustics of this room and the investment in the new speakers made a huge difference in what we're listening to now in this room is more accurate. So therefore, when you then transfer it into your car or into a, a you know, your hi-fi system, it still sounds good. Yeah. Whereas before the room and the speakers flavored the sound in such a way that then when you went to play in a different environment, it sounded absolutely diabolical. Mm. Um, so yeah, so that, that's been the game changer in that, in that we've got the confidence now in that what we're listening to translates to radio ready mixes. Yeah, yeah. You mentioned the investment we're on camera, so you can you can say nothing for this question because you don't know who's watching. Um, how much how much money do you think's been invested over the years into the studio? I've no Care idea because it's been such a such a long period of time. Yeah, and it's you, you can pick a piece of um, kit and say, well, how much was that piece of kit? And you think, well, you've got that piece of kit, that piece of kit, and that all then adds up. But then you've got all the cabling behind it and yeah. all the racks and all the infrastructure stuff. And then, it, and it's almost impossible. And uh, yeah, I guess there have been other things that we may have had to forego because of the studio certainly in my case uh, and I'm very grateful to to the wife for, for doing that doesn't apply to me really my three children ate all my money so I, <laughs> my contribution has been quite negligible in uh, in uh, material terms 
let's talk about the YouTube channel and uh, the, the channel that this interview is going to be going on. Where did the idea of creating the channel first come from, and and why why really is the the channel part of the what you're doing? I think it was Rob's idea really um, to raise the profile of the band um, and hopefully to increase the number of people who will listen to the music. The the alternative of just uploading um, music to a streaming platform is that very few people actually listen to it mm. because they just don't know about you. So having the YouTube channel should raise the profile. That's a hope. Um, when you look at the streaming platforms, it, it's very easy to upload music to it. And um, the problem is that the playlists are the critical element of the likes of Spotify. And those playlists are pretty much generated by the record label traffic, which is, you know, it's, it's their platform. So that's understandable. But trying to break into that, new artists trying to break into that is very difficult. In fact, you've given it a shot, haven't you? I've tried to put my toe in the water by publishing, uh, performing, recording and publishing some songs um, that I've written myself and that I know we wouldn't do with the band. And this involved, first of all, copywriting them, which I can do because um, I'm a member of something called the SSM from my days back in being a musician in France. So that aspect gets looked after. And then choosing a publishing company. And they also offer mastering services. So you can send your mix and they'll, they'll master it for you either with a bot online or sending it to a, a very friendly guy out in Massachusetts who did the first one for me. And then it has to go in front of the um, editorial boards of the various platforms you put it up for. What you don't get off these platforms is any information as to how they actually promote your music other than have your name and the names of the songs in the database. So what you have to do is to go back you know, to this question, what makes this, this YouTube channel really important? is that you basically have to take control of this promotion process yourself because when you do what I've done there's very little information comes back to you and the publisher comes back and, and, and suggests that you're about 25 years old and the next step is to go on your world tour and as they call it reach your fan base. They don't seem to understand that you might just want to put the stuff out there and get listened. There doesn't seem to be any kind of way of promoting it other than what they think is the standard so that is why our approach with the YouTube channel is absolutely crucial I think. I think um, when you look at what we included in our little strap line without the support of a record label this is the bit that the record labels do very well yeah. and if you are an independent artist trying to get some modicum of success and how you measure success is debatable as well. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, this is where this, this strap line came from. Can three old farts make a record and get it into the charts? Which chart is, again, <laughs> up for debate. Um, it could be, you know, some obscure chart in some, you know, South American country. But the, the idea is, can we get a record into the charts? And we don't have that support from a record label. Not that we've got anything against record labels, but you know, we are who we are, and we're not going to get signed. In, ter in terms of that, what what would constitute success? What would you like to achieve through the YouTube channel and then serving in, into the music as well? Well, I suppose the goal is ultimately to get more people to listen to our music. That that is the primary goal. It's it's the only goal really. Is is we think we've written some good music we would like other people to hear that music and as Keith has been explaining the current um, avenues yeah. that don't really generate the level of um, potential audience that, that we would like um, for the channel I guess it's got to be to get it monetized and this isn't for us to earn any income from the channel 
but we've got a lot of uh, support, free land support from the likes of the directors, choreographers, production managers, and we'd like to give something back to them. So they're giving up their time free gratis to help us on this journey. And it would be nice if we could reciprocate at some point in the future by saying, well, we've had this level of success on the YouTube channel. We'd like to share that uh, with you guys. Um, so that that would be nice. And so therefore the goals for that is a thousand subscribers and 4,000 viewing hours. Mm. In order to achieve that, you've got to throw a lot of content on the site to build up those numbers. And it's going to take a, a while for us to, to get there. In in terms of the content as well, this being the channel of the, make, the making of Maybe Never, what can new viewers um, come to expect from the channel? Why, why should they subscribe? Well, the, the starting process was... Um, could we get people interested in how we've made music? Mm -hmm. And um, that'll be breaking down the songs, how we've written them. That'll be covering a bit of the production process, looking at how we mix them, master them. But there are lots of YouTube channels that are out there that are how-to channels. And these are run by people that are far more experienced than what we are. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't want to put us out there as, this is how you do something mm. it's more of this is how we've done it and this is the journey that we're on whilst doing it and would you be interested in following us on that journey um, once the uh, EP is is finished the idea of doing the music videos creates a whole series of content in itself in that mm. we'll have the production meetings planning meetings once we've decided on what the music video is going to be about, it's going to be about scouting locations and props, and it's you know going to be more of a fly on the wall documentary about how to put together a music video, as well as on the day of filming, there'll be the behind the scenes filming of the uh, the day of the shoot. Um, and then because we're also working on the album to follow the EP. Um, we'd like to find other musicians, whether that be jazz pianists, upright bass players, to come along and you know play on some of our tracks. So we're hoping the YouTube channel might be an opening to you know um, other musicians that may want to come along and um, and work on our records. And that further collaboration that can build up, build up almost like a spider's web of people being involved with the project indeed indeed and obviously we've got the studio facility so if some of those people then want to you know record and create their own record mm. we can accommodate that here as well so a bit of give and take in that sense definitely definitely lots of reasons for people to get involved and subscribe indeed and um i know from my personal experience that i do enjoy watching people going on a journey whether it's building a boat or renovating a farm or whether they're actually on an adventure and I, I like to follow you know with that person on that journey um, so hopefully there is an audience out there that may not be that interested in um, how music is produced and how a music video is produced but are interested in our journey and being part of our journey by being a viewer and a subscriber absolutely well rob keith paul thank you for your time it's been uh, very interesting talking over the last couple of hours of, of recording of the journey that you've been on and that you're going to go on in the future and uh, hope to hear more from you soon yeah well you will if you subscribe <laughs> <laughs> maybe never maybe, maybe never <laughs> <laughs>